All right, welcome to the HR Trends webinar today. We are excited. We have some phenomenal hosts on today. We're going to talk about technology and, and a lot of good things. Uh, but to get started, let's talk with our panelists, Hill. Uh, Phil, can you give us a quick little introduction of who you are, and what you do? Sure thing. Thanks for having me, guys. Uh, my name is Phil Strazula. I run a website called Select Software Reviews, where we help companies find and buy the right software. Around 100,000 companies a month use our research to figure out what tools to buy, anything from ATS to AI. Uh, originally started my career off working in venture capital, doing early stage software investing, wanted to start a business, taught myself how to program, started an HR tech company, and then um, started SSR about five years ago. All right, and, and, and we know how important that is, right? Because there's so many people, and we're going to talk about that today, of you know what to use, why to use it, what's out there, right? What challenges there are. So Phil, thanks be, for being on. And Nicole, right? We, you know, we've talked to you before. You've been on a webinar before. You always got great things, right? You got some new stuff coming in. So, you know, thanks for taking time out of your, your busy schedule to be here. Give a little intro of who you are. So I own a local to, to Florida uh, HR and recruiting firm called Mend HR and then Mend Recruiting. And uh, we just recently launched our first tech firm, which is in, which is in the HR space, which we're going to talk a little bit about later on. I'm an international speaker. I speak on entrepreneurship, HR, employment, women's issues, uh, women's um, development and leadership roles. And I'm an author. I have a book. It's called HR is Sexy. And um, I'm going to be working on some future books here pretty soon. So that's All who I am. Right. Well, well, thank you, Nicole. And, and as always, my name is Steve Edwards. I am the CEO of Premier Virtual, podcast host for Weeding Through the BS. Uh, my book is coming out in January, but as of Saturday, now I can put the little TEDx logo behind my name as I did my TEDx so awesome. talk on Saturday. And I talked about, you know, the, the great resignation and workplace culture, right? We talked a little bit about AI, which we're going to talk about here today, because I believe workplace culture is so important, especially in the HR space as well. You know, and a lot of people know me, you know, I put on in-person job fairs for nine years. And everything kind of changed. People stopped coming to events. And I had to embrace technology. And I was not a technology guy, right? I was a face-to-face. -face, I want to shake your hands. And I had to make a change and pivot to, to virtual. This was pre-COVID. Uh, and then, you know, then COVID happened, right? So, you know, a year later, you know, people started seeing that. But not everybody embraced kind of that whole thing with virtual and everything. And we understand, right? Not everybody is, is going to like that. But let's get started right into some questions, you know, about HR. And Phil, I'm going to throw this first one to you is, what do you think, right, from your side and what you see, what's the biggest challenge for HR pros when it comes to managing tech um, and, and, and productivity tools? Yeah, I, it's kind of funny because a friend of mine just texted me and she's like newly minted COO of this company. And she's like, hey, we have like eight different softwares that do like the same thing. We're spending a quarter million dollars a year on this stuff. Um, like literally, that's the, the text conversation I had 10 minutes before this. And I think at the end of the day, there, there's 30,000 HR tools out there, literally. And like, that's the number, 30,000. That's not, you know, some like a million or whatever. And it's, it's just really hard to figure out what we should be using, how much should we pay for this stuff, who should own it, how do we make sure that we're getting the ROI out of it when it comes to renewal time. It's just a lot. And there's mo most teams, you know, this is like just another thing that's kind of thrown on your plate. Uh, and you don't have like a specialist, you, you don't have any training in this. And so I, I think from the perspective of most HR teams, it's just like, you know, kind of another thing on the to-do list, but it, it's really, really important. And it's especially important as the technology landscape changes day by day, it seems like, like if you're following along on Twitter. And so it's just like, yeah, it's incumbent upon these teams to like figure it out, but um, there's just a lot to do. What do you think they can do uh, to kind of narrow that down? You know, what are some of the things that they can do um, to, to help them to find that best technology? So there's, 
three ways that I typically think about like where to focus. Uh, so one is what, what's your business struggling with? So if your business is struggling with customer service retention rates, you might want to look into employee onboarding software. You might want to look into re recognition software. Um, what does your employee life cycle look like and, and where is it sort of breaking down, right? Is it your employer brand? You can't get people in the door. Is it your comp planning? Is it uh, the uh, career pathing? And, and then the third is just your gut. Like you're taking in all this data all day long, right? You're having conversations with yourself, with peers, with employees, and you probably know at the end of the day where you should be focused on. And so once you kind of figure out the area, then it's just about creating a short list. Uh, you can go to our website, you can ask some peer groups, you know, you're probably in some slacks or WhatsApp groups, et cetera, and just start doing demos and, and understanding what can these solutions do for you. Uh, and then try to, you know, once every quarter or once every two quarters, figure out a new solution that can help augment your talent acquisition or HR function. Yeah, absolutely. And before I forget, because I, I forgot to, uh, the, these panelists are here for you guys as well, for all of the attendees. So ask your questions in the Q&A and we will answer those live uh, directly here for you as well. So, um, you know, Phil, you, you, you kind of touch on it. I want to touch on it a little bit more, right? Because, right, your, your, you know, your website and what you have is, you, you said they can go to your website, right? But but how does that work for organizations that are out there? Yeah, so it's funny that my friend who's texting me is like, hey, I just I just read like seven articles on your website about like, what's a tech-enabled PEO? How do I, you know, audit my tech stack, right? And like, how do I like take my 250K and shrink it down to $100,000, which is like what it probably should be? How much should I actually pay for bamboo HR? And should I use their payroll system? Should I use something else? Should I use something for international that's different? Um, there, there's there's a million different things. There's how to get buy-in from your boss. There's how to think about return on investment. Pricing is opaque in, in most of these instances. And so there, there's a lot to learn. And that's why I think it's super overwhelming. A lot of people just don't start because they're like, I'm going to put my head in the sand. Uh, I don't, I don't want to go down this path. It's just like, it's too much brain damage. But I, I think you have to start carving out like 5%, 10%, which is like, you know, a, a demo a week, a, a couple of calls, a, a lunch with a peer to just learning this stuff because you got to get good at it. Otherwise, you're not going to have a job in a couple of years. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Nicole, I'm going to ask you the same question. But, I, you know, last week I was at a military symposium uh, and, and I talked to some people out there. Right. And I asked them a couple of quick questions. One, who hates virtual? I didn't ask who likes it. I asked who hates it, right? Because I knew there was a lot of people that are very anti. Few hands went up, you know, and then you then I asked them, who here has ever used video interview software? Nobody raised their hands. None of them. They didn't even know what it was. So you're 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 you know, all of these people that were were there didn't even know what some of the technology is. So to touch on where you're at, Phil, it's you know, you have to put some time into researching to know. What's out there? Because if you don't yeah. know what's out there, you, you can't help them, you know. And and I, and I said to one one of the ladies that was like, "Who hates virtual?" And and I said it. Obviously, that's what we do. Um, is 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 part of our software. But I said, "Are you thinking about you, or are you thinking about your end user?" And I go, "That's who you have to think about, not yourself. What you like or what you don't like. You have to think about your end user." Now, the great news, she came up to me after and said, hey, I need some training so I can be educated more on this. And that really goes into what you were saying, Phil, is they need to educate themselves on what's out there. Now, Nicole, I know you sit with a lot of organizations, you know, in, in what you do is what do you see are some of the, the challenges from, right, either CEOs or the HR people um, of the organizations that you sit down with? Well, the CEO is always money. It's always money. Like, how much am I going to spend? Why am I going to spend this? What is it going to do for me? Why is it, why am I adding something else to my, to our bottom line? And then when I get to the HR team, it's always, well, it's a fear. There's a fear of, well, this can do my job. Uh, this is going to cut down on how many people I need in my department. Uh, so 
so that fear goes into, all right, so we're going to use the, the least amount of technology possible to get us by. Uh, and that's where you get the eight different systems, uh, where most people will use the eight different systems that are, you know, maybe $5 a user or, you know, something like that, especially on the ATS side. You'll see that a lot on, a, on the applicant tracking system. You'll see somebody will use an applicant tracking system that is either free or very non-existent. So they'll continue to use Indeed for the most part for their applicant tracking instead of one that integrates into their other systems. But I think from an HR professional's um, perspective and what we go in and, and we talk to our business owners about is streamlining your HR, making it more simplified. Yes, you're, you may lose staff in your HR department, but HR depart your HR department is not a revenue generating department. So how do we turn that revenue generating department, re non-revenue generating department into something that's producing more effective and efficient revenue for you, which is your hiring, which is your uh, emotional intelligence stuff. And that's where when we talk about AI a little later, that's where that piece is going to come in. But most of it, from a business owner perspective, it comes down to cost. Um, they're not going to be using the system for the most part, unless they're a really small business and the owner is involved in the weeds, they're not going to be using the system, but they're going to want to know the cost. And that's usually our biggest hang up. With the HR individuals, it is all about fear and about losing jobs. And is this going to work for me um, so that I can continue in my on my career path? So I want it's to so true. Me. Oh, go ahead, Phil. Yeah. I, I was just gonna say it's it's so true. I was at this um conference and there were like two tracks, and and in one room there was uh HR tech uh talk, and the other room it was something about I think diversity and inclusion. And like 90% of the people opted to go in the DEI room. And at lunch, which is immediately afterwards, somebody was asking like, you know, which one did you go to and why? And most people were like, I don't want to learn about how I'm not going to have a job in a few years. Um, so I'm just going to like not learn about the, the technology stuff because it's just, it's a fear thing. Um, Steve, I was curious when, when you asked the crowd about like, do you hate virtual? Does that mean like, anything online does that mean like like what did that mean actually i uh, like virtual virtual job fairs oh okay virtual because, job you know fairs. a lot of those that they'll do like get military installations or a lot of veterans organizations out there do virtual job fairs okay so it was did you right some people people either love or hate virtual and 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 it's they don't want to embrace the change right where you just said some of the people didn't want to go in that room because they think they're going to lose their jobs Think about like this, and this is how I brought, I, I kind of brought it up is, you know, first I want to tell a story about my dad. My dad worked retail for almost 40 years. Oh, God and he was a him. manager of a, of, of a farm department, small town, Wisconsin, at a big retail store. Well, customers used to come to him and say, I want this. So he would take his notepad, he'd write it down, he'd walk into the back and he'd come back and say, this is how many I have. And he'd say, I want it. So then you'd have to go back and get it. So they brought in computers and he said, I'm retiring, done. He refused to embrace change. Yeah. So when you think about it, right, and I kind of call it, you know, the old school versus the new school. Are you embracing change? The people that embrace change should not be scared that they're going to lose jobs. They should say, how am I going to use AI? How am I going to use this technology to enhance this? Well, to make myself better, I think right. I think that that's the the key the key thing about it is that tech only makes you better at your job. It makes you more efficient and more effective. Where you can focus as an HR person, your role is typically um, not valued in the inner circle of the CEO or the C suite. Because you're so much in the weeds of doing things that you can't you can't learn new aspects of how to help the company grow and excel. But if, if you take HR tech and you add it into your your repertoire and your business and what you're doing as an HR professional, you now free yourself up to sit at that table in the C-suite and be able to add 
so much more value to growing and enhancing the business because you're not worried about tracking how many applicants came in last week and how many didn't get their uh, rejection letters and how many background screens. Something's already doing that for you. Now you can focus on being a value add and helping generate revenue instead of being a non-revenue non generating department. Absolutely. Phil, did you want to touch base on that too? No, it, 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 and that makes sense, right? It's use technology to embrace it, right? Those who don't want to embrace it, it's the, they're the ones that are going to lose the jobs, unfortunately. You have to embrace technology. Guess what? Technology is here to stay. At one point, we all used calling cards, you know? Now, we might have phone numbers from places that we lived 15 years ago because you have long distance. Technology changes and you have to keep up with technology. And that's why I think, you know, um, like Phil and, and, and his website is so important because it kind of does the work there for you is, hey, we're going to go out. We're going to look at this and say, hey, oh, I want to look at the, the top reviews, you know, because it's it's a lot of work, right? You said 30,000 HR. Nobody's going to go through all that. But if they have a website that says, I want to come to this, that makes a lot of sense to me, right? And I know I use multiple to be able to say, I want to make it easier, right? Because I'm getting LinkedIn LinkedIn messages on a daily basis. Use my software. All these messages, everybody's coming in, right? And, and it gets to be overwhelming. How do you know? How do you know what's going to be good? You know, talking about AI, and, and, and you said this, Nicole, what do you think, right? AI versus the worker shortage. What so do you think? So I am loving AI. Like I, even as an HR professional and recruiting professional, I'm loving the value add that AI has. What, what people fail to realize is at the moment, and at, now it could be five or 10 years out, I, I don't know. AI doesn't have emotional intelligence at this point. And so it's not going to completely replace the human interaction. And I think that that's what most people are scared about. They're like, oh, well, AI is going to completely um, replace everything about a job. And that's just not the case. There are some, there are roles that you have to have human interaction with and human intelligence and emotional and emotional but AI is is so fantastic. If if anybody has used Chat GPT, um, it took me a little while because I just it, it wasn't like I was going into Chat to do all of this. But there's some individuals on my team that were like, "You've got to see this. Like, you've got to see what this does." And you type in your question, and it comes up with like all of this stuff. Question like gives you questions and answers it, as a as a CEO or business owner, you want questions for a potential new C-suite person, you type it into chat GPT and it gives you some of the best questions on the planet that you could ask somebody for a role that it would take you four or five, six hours of research to get these same questions. Even Google, you're Googling through all of this. So I think AI has its place and it has a, a great place in our, in, in our society. And it's, Worker shortage, uh, Steve, we had this conversation before. I think the difference is, is there's not a worker shortage is there's no people to work. The worker shortage is skilled workers, is people that you're looking for on a more skilled level. So uh, organizations wanting somebody who has five years experience versus hiring somebody that doesn't have the actual experience and training that individual because they don't have the time or the infrastructure to be able to train that individual. I think that that's where the worker shortage is coming in. Uh, we have a gap. There's a gap in the a skill gap because there were a lot of um, tenured individuals that left the workplace or went into different different um, careers because of COVID and um, it left them with a good opportunity. But I think the, that AI can help um, alleviate some of that worker shortage uh, where you can use them, use AI to fill to HR tech, to fill some of those roles that you're having a hard time finding. But do I think in the next five to 10, even 15 years, it's going to completely um, replace the workers? I, I just don't see that happening because um, we still have such a service 
driven society where that face-to-face -face interaction is necessary. Uh, Phil, Phil, what's your take on AI versus kind of the worker shortage? Yeah, I I think we have we have no idea how quickly or not the uh, technology is going to continue to get better. And so if it continues on the current pace in five years, you know, we either live in like a, a wasteland or, or paradise. Um, I think it's, it's probably going to plateau uh, <laughs> like long before that. And it's probably just going to be this like productivity tool that it's sort of like software, right? But it'll be adopted much faster. And so I think in the white collar world, it probably will solve some of these issues. I think like the Fed uh, is like doing an, an okay job of like, you know, making uh, people hire less, which, you know, it sucks. Like it, that's not what we want to see in the economy for sure, especially in the short term. Um, but I think at the end of the day, like we just have a structural issue in the Western world where there aren't enough people to do the jobs and it's, it's cashiers, it's truck drivers, it's nurses, it's computer programmers. Like there just, there aren't enough people to support um, the demand for goods and services. And that can, you know, only be changed by more people, um, AKA immigration or by technology. And uh, it seems unlikely that like, we're going to have um, a more, whatever, open immigration policy in, in this country. Um, and so, you know, hopefully the technology can, can step in and help us because otherwise we're just going to see inflation very persistently, right? Like if wages keep going up, if unemployment is below 4%, wages are going to increase and goods and services are going to increase and the Fed's going to increase uh, the interest rates. And eventually that's going to lead to like some really severe things beyond like a First Republic or Silicon Valley Bank. Yeah, there's a lot, right? I, <laughs> I think we could strike a balance. I think if, if we strike the right balance between AI um, and, and use it for the right things, I think it's going to help with certain jobs that that that, that can't be done. Um, See, there's a couple yeah. questions in the Q&A. Yep. All right. We have uh, one of the questions that we have in here is, do you find that passive candidates are less willing to go through a video interview process? I, I personally would say yes. I, I think that I, I'm like a huge proponent of video interviews and we, we use them extensively in our interview process. And like, I, I just think they, they work really well. Um, they allow people to, to showcase themselves beyond just a resume. I think you have to be really careful with the candidate experience. And like, you, you can't ask like a C-suite person, like, hey, can you use video interview as a first step, right? They're gonna be like, no. Um, or, or really anybody who's in like a lot of demand, anytime you create friction, you're going to have drop off. And I think especially for if you're asking somebody, hey, like you're a really good fit. Um, can you like prove even further <laughs> that you're a good fit? It's going to be like, no, I'm, I'm good. Uh, so I, I think you just have to be careful with the messaging, have a lot of empathy and, and understand where that person is at from a headspace perspective. So so let me ask, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this a little further before I jump over to you, Nicole, on this. <clears throat> So essentially, right, there's two different types of video interviews, right? There's me giving you essentially a live interview on video yeah. or like the video interview software. Here's a group of 10 video questions. You answer them back. Yeah. So is that what you're talking about that you use, Phil, the, the software side of things or the, the we, we'll call we it do, the Zoom interview? Yeah, we, we do both synchronous and asynchronous. We do async to start because it's like, hey, you get 300 resumes take the top 10% that you think are, are okay. So that 30 and have them all do like two question video interview. Right. And it, it takes 10 minutes for them. And for you, you get to save the 30 minutes because most people in two minutes, you're like, this is a yes or a no. Right. Um, and, and a lot of people are no's for, for various reasons. And so that's what we do. And then we do the synchronous, you know, on a zoom or, or whatever video interview. All right. Nicole, you want to touch on that? So passive candidates, live interviews are hands down way better with, with um, passive candidates versus um, sending them a link and saying, hey, here, answer these 10 questions. Um, I do believe that the pay demographic is going to play a huge role in who's willing to get on those um, kind of passive interview calls where it's not a live person. 
um, I generally find that my lower the lower wage workers are going to be more apt to get on or younger workers are going to be more apt to get on and answer the 10 questions and do a video interview versus someone who's in a higher pay demographic if you're looking at c-suites or directors or managers who are like no i don't have time for this like i just i want to get to a person um, so I do think it's variable between kind of what position you're hiring for and what position you're not. Uh, I know Indeed rolled out um, their own version of it, of, you know, being able to send in interview questions or whatever. It's not widely popular. Uh, we tested it on one of our positions and at not one person, it didn't matter the pay demographic or position, not one person opted to do that video interview. So uh, I'm however, ask you this, Nicole, I know you probably did, but a lot of people don't, right? And I see certain things like this, even on the virtual side. And I tell people, don't do this. Did you let them know before you sent that, that they were going to do video interview questions, or did you just send it off to them? So we did let them know. Okay. Um, so we communicate with all of our candidates. Um, we told them it was an option. Okay. Um, we didn't want to require it because we didn't want to lose the candidates. Um, and sometimes if you do that, you have a possibility of just turning them off right away and you lose a candidate. And then that could have been your hire, you know? And so we told them it was an option and not one person did it. Um, now I, I do know that there are a lot of companies and we've come in and we've cleaned that up with a lot of our clients that do, they just use the whole just do this, do this, do this, instead of meeting and having those communication with the candidates up front. Yeah, I see it in the virtual world where I tell we, we train clients is don't just go out and just hit the button to send them a video, right? During a virtual job fair, don't just hit the video. Let them know, hey, we're going to send you a video. Are you, are you available for video? Because what if they're not available for video, right? What happens if they don't have a shirt on? What happens if they're not in an appropriate place? for that video and then they just they deny it does that look bad on them right right but and and you know we're we're very careful about it because if you have a passive candidate more than likely they have a job and if i'm sending them an interview and they lose their job because they were they got this i mean you've you've been on websites where you open the website and there's a video that plays really loud and you don't know what who's going to hear that interview when it pops up. So, yeah, we have to be very careful. I, I mean, they could be going out there and searching their social media, too. So, you know, well, <laughs> you know, I always got to bring that in. Phil, Phil, do you guys let them know that they're going to have a they're, they're doing that kind of video um, or do you just send it off to them first? Yeah, we, we try to be pretty clear about the candidate process in general. And so I, I mentioned like, we start off with like, you know, 300 resumes, we cut it down to like 30. So what we say is, hey, like you're in the top 10%, like we're serious about you. Um, but the way that we work is like, we wanna spend a lot of time with like four people. And so the, the best way for us to do that is this, this like short assessment, if you don't mind taking it, uh, you know, don't spend more than 10 minutes on it. And it's usually three questions, two are text, one's a video. Um, just like testing their knowledge and then getting a sense for like, you know, are they presentable it, depending on the role, right? Some roles, it doesn't matter. Um, right. Yeah, but that's what we do. And, and we, we don't make it optional. And I would say probably like 90% of people will do it. Yeah. So I lead more on that side, right? I believe, right. If we send it out to them, like you do, let them know, Hey, we're weeding this down because if you really are, I, I understand you're maybe a passive candidate. But if you're a passive candidate and you're out there looking for a job, that means you're quiet quitting over here. You're not happy with where you're at. So if you really want this and this is how we do things, you'll create the video. If you don't, that means you're really not that interested. And it, to me, yeah. it weeds that candidate out pretty quickly because yeah. they don't want to go down that road. So if you if you think about it and you knew I was going to challenge you on this. I know. And you go. knew I was. So if you think about not everybody's comfortable on camera yep. without a two-way street. And if their position is not directly in a camera on a regular basis, counting somebody out because they're not okay being on video like that and recording themselves, I think that especially in our worker shortage 
situation that we have, I think you're actually doing more of a disservice. Um, if you're saying, you know, this is the way we do things, you need to record yourself on a video. If you don't record yourself on a video, we're not continuing, we're not, um, we're not moving forward. I think that can actually harm you as an organization trying to find the right candidate because reputation is everything. And, you know, it took me, I mean, how long did it take you to get comfortable being on camera? I mean, it took me almost three and a half years of constantly being on camera and doing short things to be comfortable enough where I can actually sit here and have a good conversation and understand that if my eye looks funny for a minute, it's not the end of the world, you know, instead of, you know, critiquing myself. So I think you have to be very careful about just wiping somebody off because they don't want to do the video and maybe come up with an alternative um, of something that may video related that may be a little bit more comfortable for them. I get that. Right. And and we all know, right. Like I talk about workplace culture, right. Mm -hmm. We got a top place to work. Um, but I think, you know, to me, it comes down is do they really want to be part of the team? And, and so again, I know we look at things in a different way on, on, on a lot of that. I want to, I, I like, if, if somebody can't do what I'm looking for now, if they send me email, say, Hey, I just don't feel comfortable on the camera. Can I do something else? Great. But how many people just are out there just submitting their resumes, right? Phil, yeah. let me ask you, right? 300 resumes, right? And I guarantee everybody here that's on talent acquisition have gotten resumes that don't qualify, whatever, right? Because people just click, 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 click. You, ah. get, into that, you get into the unemployment tree right right they they click their feet up they put their thing they're watching jerry springer right they're like oh, i just applied to 50 jobs so to me right and i did recruiting and job fairs for a long time i want the people that i know are serious so even if somebody may not be good on camera right are they serious about that but they yeah. emailed you and said hey i'm not comfortable is there an alternative no, they, that's what i'm talking about them. what if they didn't email they if they just i respond and say hey this is how we do it and they don't even respond back well then your lack of communication so right. there i mean that's a that's a key skill but just like if if they're emailing and they're communicating with you about it i don't think you wipe them off the map for that's a different story yeah. right yeah. that you can go but if they don't communicate then, you know, that's just like somebody not responding to your call or email about, you know, setting up an interview. That's the same concept. You don't you don't continue to call somebody um, if they're not responding. Correct. Right. And but but there's a lot of recruiters out there, too, that don't call people back. So, oh, uh, yeah, definitely. I Trust me, I'm aware. Yeah. All right. We got, another, we got another couple of some good questions here. This is going to jump back into A.I. So. Ooh. If AI does the work for us, where do we fit in? I love the support, but what's left for HR to do? I think we're a long ways away from that happening. So, I mean, if, if we were actually in that in that world, like this is what I was talking about earlier, right? Like if we're in a world where like AI can actually do the job of HR and like have empathy and like all this stuff, like we're either going to be living in paradise or something terrible is going to happen and somebody's going to misuse the technology. So that, that's a long ways away. And when it happens, don't worry about it. Cause like, it's totally out of your control. <laughs> um, and it's either going to be really good or really bad. Well, and I, and I think also like right to Phil's point, the empathy right now, AI does not have the ability to have emotional intelligence. It doesn't have the ability to decipher human emotion um, and being in an HR role on a day-to-day -day basis, that's your job is sitting and deciphering human emotion and basically pay, playing the, the biggest psychologist in the world. And right now, AI does not have that capability. Will it in 10, 20 years? We have no idea. Um, but at this moment, it doesn't. And I don't think that that's a concern in the near future. Yeah. And I think there's enough out there that you're still going to need people. Maybe there's not as many HR staff, but you're still going to need HR staff, right? Because you got the, the talent acquisition side and then you have everything else. Right. right? So there's there, there's two sides. And, 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 you know, even if you take the talent acquisition side, right, how many people go out there, right? And this is going to get into the next question is, right, how many people out there 
just post a job on a job board and just say, oh, I'm only going to call the people that come in. You know, those are the resumes that I call. They're not looking at it, right? And I look at there's two different types of recruiters, right? Just like there's two different types of salespeople, right? There's salespeople that are hunters and there's salespeople that are farmers that only want that phone to ring. It's a two different thing. And I think there's the same kind on recruiters, right? So, you know, the next question is, is kind of goes right into this is in this age of automation and tech, should recruiters still be picking up the phone to call passive candidates? I think a hundred percent. Yes. That's, that's like so differentiated. It's contrarian. It's like everybody, I don't know about you, you guys' emails. Like my inbox since ChatGPT got launched has blown up with spam. And it used to, you know, you, you always get spam, right? But like, it's, it's probably increased 10 X. And I think, you know, all of these like AI sourcing tools, which are awesome. And like, I think people should totally check them out. At the end of the day, there it's sort of like self-defeating because everybody using them. So the person used to get three emails gets 50, but nobody's picking up the phone because one, that's like a hard thing to do. Nobody wants to face the rejection, uh, but it's not built into these tools. Like the AI isn't going to call somebody. Uh, so if, if you're doing that, I think you're at a huge advantage. I agree. I agree with Phil a hundred percent on that. Like you're going to have to pick up the phone. A hundred percent. I am all about the phone. My team knows that. I believe it's right. You can still have that personal communication, right? Cause, cause you know, you know, Phil, you talked about this and I'll tell everybody, this is a little trick I have, right? This is a small little trick, but it's on LinkedIn, right? We all get bombarded by automation on LinkedIn. So if you know my LinkedIn, it's Stephen G period Edwards. So I know if somebody actually types in my name, they'll say Steve or Steven. Automation, they always pick up the Stephen G. So yeah. anytime somebody sends me a message, Stephen G, I looked at your profile. I love what you're doing. I see the work that you do. Remember, it was automated, right? right? And you know that it's that. And then they continue to go. So I know those automated, right? So I didn't do that on purpose, but I learned pretty quick that those were the automated things, right? And those are the kind of small little things you could do to see what's automated and what's real that's out there. All right. Yeah. I, I, th I think you, you wear like the, the, the calling as like a badge of honor to like, there, there's this guy uh, that I know he's a bro he's a real estate broker and like, you know, like he's just a hustler and he, 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 he dials probably like 60, 70 people a day. He's, he's a multi, multi-millionaire. One of the sharks from shark tank is like an investor in his fund and all this stuff. And like, he's still cold calling people. Cause like, that's how business gets done in a lot of industries. And I think recruiting it's, it's going to be the case for a very long time. And it's especially true in a world where everybody's relying on these automations because it's just, it's easy to be lazy. Right. And it's like, Hey, I'm, I'm still sourcing. I'm still getting my candidates. So the people who are actually still going to have the fortitude to do that are, are going to be really successful. And if you, if you see how many emails you get with spam, imagine that person you're trying to get in touch with for a job, how many spam emails and call and uh, LinkedIn messages they're receiving as well. So if you're picking up the phone and calling them, you are going to stand out. You're going to be like, okay, so you're not just spam. You know, you're, you're a real human that's looking to fill this role. Yeah, I got, um, I, I won't say the name of the job board. They're not one of the top ones anymore, but I haven't had my resume on there in 12 years. And about every year or so, it used to be a lot more. It used to be every six months. It'd be like, hey, I just saw your resume on this job board. And I would, I, would your up, I would pick up and I would call them. I'd be like, oh, you just saw my resume? That's great. Just so you know, I haven't had my resume on there in years. They're reselling the data, right? So that's what some of these websites will do. So these people are getting, you know, just bombarded with emails. So to get that passive candidate, Go after them, make the phone call, do something. And I tell, I tell everybody this, do what other people are scared to do. Yeah. People don't want to pick up this phone, right? This is your friend. Use it in talent acquisition, right? It's, it's not there. Somebody comes in, do you send them a, an automatic email that goes out and you pick up and say, Hey, you know, I just wanted to touch base. I just received your resume. We'll look it over and uh, let you know. I'm a huge proponent of the fan. You know, Phil, you said something earlier, and I just I just want to go back before I answer the next question. We talk about the unemployment rate. 
But I want everybody before I when I when I when I when I ask this question, I want everybody to think of this number and I want you to write it down. OK, so when I ask this question, I want you to write the number down before I give the answer. How many people quit their jobs in 2022? So everybody write to everybody who's listening to this. I want you to write down how many people you think quit their jobs in 2022. So I'll give you just a couple numbers. U.S. population is 334 million. There's 160 million in, in the U.S. working population. We talk about the unemployment rate, but how many people quit their jobs in 2022? I'm going to say 30 million. Okay. Nicole, what do you think? I'm going to say about 22.5 million. 50.5 million people quit their jobs in 2022. Right, we talk about the Great Resignation was in 2020, but realistically, last year was a record. 2021 was a record at 47 million people. So think about that. All these people are quitting jobs. All these people talk about, oh, the grass is greener on the other side. Right? I like to say, you know, where the grass is greener is where you water it. So many people always think they're going out, but we talk about the unemployment. Almost a third of the working population quit their jobs. Why? Right? Culture, employee experience. What are they doing, right? HR tech, this is what this is all about. But a lot of times, right, is when you're recruiting, what are some of the things that you think that you can do, kind of Nicole, right? I'm going to kind of just throw this one at you is to get people to want to work for an organization. Well, I, I talked, I touched on it a little bit prior and the reputation. Um, and a lot of organizations don't want to admit that they have um, a terrible reputation. The world is small. And I, being in recruiting and have been in recruiting for so long, I've seen how every industry is incestuous. So you have people that jump from this place to this place and come back and, and, and do all of these things. And people will jump for 25 cents more an hour and, you know, just different things in the recruiting or in the the industry and it all comes back to reputation and values and now in in 2021 2022 and now 2023 we have the largest group of activists that are uh working in our workplaces and i i don't mean activists in a bad in a bad sense i mean activists who are looking to change something, looking to make the world a better place, looking for, for these. And if you have an organization that is not on board or um, being truthful to the values and the mission that they're saying that they are shooting for, you're going to have an exodus out of that company. You're not going to be able to recruit individuals into the organization if the values don't align. And so as to recruit and to bring on talent, an organization needs to be true to who they are and that reputation will precede them and they'll be able to get more talent. And I, it, it sounds easy, but it's obviously way more complicated than that. But most companies just don't hold true to who they say they are. And um, so when that happens, it impacts the workplace culture. You hire people or bring people on board that don't match those values and then nobody's happy and then you get toxicity and then it's just a trickle down effect. So hiring into your organization or establishing who you are as an organization is probably the most important thing. And if, and if you feel like you know who you were as an organization, it's you got to go back and uh, reevaluate those things today versus what they were five or 10 years ago. I love where you went with that, right? Because I, I kind of had a feel I could get you to go down the path that I knew I was going to get, right? And this is going to answer a question that was asked before as well, is, right, where are we going to go, right, if there's there? Do you as organizations, or do you guys see this out there, organizations let their ATSs kind of filter and kick out candidates? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Why? Anybody, can anybody, why do you think they, Phil, I'm going to throw this to you, right? This is, this is kind of a tough one, but why do you think organizations let the ATSs weed them out? I think 
this is like one of the core reasons why Apple Traction systems were designed in the first place, right? It was like resume parsing. And I think that it's just easier. Um, like these, most of these algorithms like aren't that good. Like if you look at like the automated scoring of resumes, like even on assessments where people are entering more structured or unstructured data, like they're just not that good, but people are lazy. Um, most people are lazy. Most people's compensation, especially I would say a lot of internal talent acquisition teams, like the comp is not really incentive driven. And so you're, you just kind of have a job, right? Maybe you get a 10% bonus at the end of the year. If you're at a third party recruiting firm, you're going to be more of that like hunter mentality. You're going to have a lot of your comp is incentive driven. Uh, and so you're going to be more holistic in, in looking at the people that come in the door, but I think it's just a laziness thing. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. Nicole, you want to touch on that? So I, I think it definitely is a laziness thing. Um, it's just more effective and, or they feel it's more effective is to let the ATS do what it's going to do in the algorithm. Um, and what, the, the problem with that is, is you uh, people fail or organizations fail to realize that your larger job boards are money driven. And so those money driven are going to decide the candidates that you get, the applications that you get, the people who see your job posting is determined by uh, how much money you're putting towards that position. If it's a free, you're going to get the lowest, the lowest bottom match to your job. You're going to get those applications are going to go to those people. And I, I think that it's also a lack of understanding how the algorithms work, uh, a lack of understanding of how the job boards are working and how they're not um, employee friendly. They're, they're not in your favor as much as people want to think that, oh, these job boards are fantastic. Uh, and, and it just goes back to laziness. They really don't care. It's, it's useful for what they need at the time. And they're filtering out very adequate and qualified candidates. Yeah. I, I see that a lot, right. And, and back we'll go previous to where I'm at now is I used to be able to beat every algorithm. I'd figure it out on, on all of the job boards. I would know how to have that top spot. And I would always figure it out and every time, right? Because they all change and, and, and they have, right? And now we know that some of them, there's a necessary evil, we'll call it, right? Because that's where the cans are. You have to use these things. Right. But now think outside of that, right? Think of recruitment marketing. Think of the other things that are out there, right? And how can you use technology right? To not have to do that. Um, we have another, another question here is, have you ever missed out on a potential candidates for hard to fill roles due to lengthy hiring process? Oh, every day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like every day. If our clients, if their, um, if their process is four weeks long and six weeks long and they're slow and they're just not moving. They have this interview they have to do in this interview. We lose them all the time, all the time. And we fire those clients. Yeah. I, I think, you know, it's, it's, and this goes all the way back. Like I used to have a, a manager and long time ago when somebody would come in, he was the director and he would have, he would make them sit in a chair for an hour waiting on him an hour why because he wanted to see if they would wait there and I was like I won't tell you what I called him but I was like that's just the worst thing you can do like why would you do something like that but that's the that was an in-person interview this was like the third interview that they had already gone through to get to this guy's level and he would do that just to see and to see if they would give him an attitude when he got into the interview because they had to wait an hour long interview processes they're, they're, they're just not neat. Phil, you, you want to touch on that at all? Or, um, I, I think I have somewhat of a different opinion about this actually. So okay, I love that for, yeah. for certain roles, like it's like, yeah, if you're going to hire somebody to do something that's fairly low skilled, like it should be like, I don't know, maybe a, a 90 minute, like from apply to hire sort of thing. Um, in, in an ideal world, right? You get them in a chat bot, you ask them a couple knockout questions, you get them on a phone with the recruiter, boom, offer letter. Um, 
I think for like, for a lot of companies, like you want a pretty solid, like you want them to talk to a couple of people. You probably want to do some sort of like project with them, make sure that they're a good cultural fit, stuff like that. You just have to like, you have to move expeditiously. Um, but even expeditiously many times means like four weeks and you have to set the right expectations and tell them why you're doing it and actually have like data to back it up. So like in our company, like, you know, we have like unbelievably high retention. Um, and that's because like we do a four week, like fairly rigorous process, but we only do it with two people. Right. So like we'll, we'll get those 300 resumes, we do the 30 screens, we'll do five, like, you know, talk, talk to you. And then two people will, will sort of do it in parallel. We'll have meet you a project and hire one of them. Um, I don't think we've ever lost a candidate for sure. Like the runner up sometimes is pissed off, but it's like, well, we, we told you at the beginning what, what this was going to be like. Um, and we try not to waste your time. We were transparent about it, but I think you have to do that. Uh, and I also think that like for certain jobs, like I'm thinking about like my first job out of college, I worked in investment banking. Like, I think like you, you, the, the thing that your, your boss used to do, like, I think that wouldn't be like a bad test because you just have to like eat a lot of crap and like, just like deal with it and put a smile on your face. Like you got to work you know, hundred hour weeks and, you know, then they stick you in front of a client and you're 23 and you got to like do the whole dog and pony show. So like, yeah, contrarian take, but like, I, I don't, I don't think those are a bad processes as long as they're run correctly. You know, you, you said something right. That, that kind of makes a lot of sense. You set the right expectations up yeah. front. Yep. Now, if you just go in and say, Hey, this is going to be an interview process. And then it starts going long. I think you're going to lose people. But I think if you set the right expectations, it's there. And we do something kind of similar to what you you talked about, Phil, is, and we just went through this, right? We're in an interview process. We had two people. We loved them both. And we said, we're going with the other one. My business partner calls me and goes, I think we need to find a position for the other person as well. Mm -hmm. So we ended up finding a role within the company because we liked both of them. And we knew because I'm very, and we're very here is I'll hire for really for personality and a cultural fit more than just a skill, right? Certain jobs require certain skills that you have to have, but if you can come in and you can have the right fit within our organization, maybe you start somewhere, but we're going to move you in a different position. There's a lot of people that started in one role in our company that now work in another role. I, I talk about a lot, Glenn who came in and he started within one role with our company. We created something else for him. And now he kind of was more, more than me, the face of the company, right? Everybody e daily, I get emails of how much he, he, you know, is, is valuable to our clients out there. And it's because we made our employees first and then they take care of our clients that are out there. So I, I think that setting the right expectations and, and, and hiring for the right cultural fit to me is, 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 is so important. And I see that, Phil, what you're saying, right? hundred hours. I understand that. Right. I, I, I definitely get that. So. Uh, and, I, and I think that that's okay for someone in a certain age group, age, they understand that. But when you're, when you're hiring a younger, the younger generation, it's not, I mean, they don't tolerate hundred hour work weeks. They just don't, they'll leave. I mean, it's, uh, and that's statistics that you could pull up anywhere. I think that you have to, you have to, you have to manage your recruiting process and your interviewing process based on your candidate and the position. Um, obviously, like you said, Phil, some positions are going to um, maybe require being a CEO of a company. You're not going to hire in two days. Um, you know, there, there's a little lengthy, more lengthy of a process. But the instant gratification for anybody millennial and younger, um, you're three to five days, they're gone. And they're a great candidate. They're a great cultural fit and everything, but they're not going to wait around. Um, and we, and that's just something that companies are just going to have to start streamlining there. And that's where HR tech comes in. They're going to have to streamline their recruiting process. They're going to have to make those interviews less and they're going to have to make them more quality versus the quantity um, because your younger generations just aren't going to hang around for those four to six weeks of an interview process. You get it. You also got to hook them with strong employee value propositions. Otherwise, 
there it's just a commodity your commodity yeah. offering yeah yeah i agree right uh man what uh, some amazing things today on this webinar last question how do we use technology to better hire based on skills needs and weed in rather than weed out what does weed in mean um I, i'm gonna guess uh i'm that's a term i've not heard either <laughs> Interesting. We're, gonna guess it. we're gonna we're gonna take a while i'm gonna take a stab at this one okay so if it's if it's the opposite of weeding out right it's real easy to weed somebody out based on a resume or a skill but how can we look at them maybe it's on the video interview the, the the phone call or something with them you see i said phone call um right is how can we find out um or or using technology to find out more about them than let's call it an ATS weeding them out because they didn't have the right word in there or the, the, the right phrase in. Yeah. I guess the mentality is like going beyond the resume, like you get to showcase your skills. And I think that, yeah, it, 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 as you said earlier, like people want going indeed, they just click, click, click. So that you get tons of applications and some people, some people on resume or, or on paper don't look that good. Uh, you got to give those people an opportunity and the people who are just clicking, you got to also give them an opportunity to showcase that they don't actually care. Uh, and so what we do, what I recommend, and it depends on role by role basis, but just like a couple of questions where people can really showcase their knowledge in like specific ways. And then what I personally like about the assessments, so the video interview software that we use, it shows how long somebody spent on the video interview. And sometimes people spend like 40 minutes. And so it's like, okay, they did like 20 takes. Um, and we actually just hired a guy who spent like 40 minutes and his last take ended after 15 seconds with, oh crud. And then he clicked and then he, he hit submit by accident. And so I sent him an email. I was like, hey man, like, it seems like you messed that up. He's like, oh my God, I'm so embarrassed. And he sent like another video. Um, and I was like, okay, like this guy like really wants to work here. And so even though he honestly like didn't have the on paper, like expertise, it was like, he, he's going to work hard. Um, and I think that's even more important. So. Perfect. Well, I just, everybody knows I'm dropping, uh, the, the contact information. So if you want to talk more to, to Phil, Nicole, or myself, I'm dropping in all of their emails, um, into the chat right now. Because I know there's a lot more questions that are out there. And, and you know, I'm, I know I could ask a ton and have a lot of conversations with Phil and, and Nicole, you know, about technology and why it's important. Uh, but if you guys want to reach out to them, you know, you can reach directly out to them as well, um, you know, to get more questions. Um, you know, Phil runs, uh, you know, his, his website, amazing. If you're looking to narrow that technology down, right? Let him do the work for you. You know, and, and Nicole is phenomenal at what she does, sitting down with the companies and really finding out what are the best strategies for you. So you got the technology, how to use the technology and how, what strategies you have to be able to really go in. And then obviously we have the, the, the virtual platform and the stuff that we do on the back for, back as well. So Nicole, I think I cut you off there, but I wanted to get it out before anybody else dropped off. Well, I just wanted to to say um, piggybacking on what what Phil was saying about the um, I just lost my train of thought. So there you go. It's three o'clock. I do want to uh, say I, you thought about technology and uh, like video interview. Software. Oh, yeah. Video interview. So okay, yeah. I, I just went to I, I was just at a conference. I spoke at a conference in London and, and one of the one of the there was a, a young gentleman that came up to me afterwards and he wanted to talk because he said that he doesn't he doesn't look good on paper and he knows he doesn't look good on paper. And my recommendation was to him and it, it was to do some videos and start posting things on LinkedIn because to uh, it's a popular thing going to social media and viewing your candidates and doing some research and and th things like that so so I told him I said you know so what I would challenge talent acquisition is to start looking at the LinkedIn 
Um, because some people, will, they are starting to post, they're starting to do videos, they're starting to showcase like their personalities, their missions and, and what they're looking for. And that's going a little bit above and beyond the resume. Uh, he sent me his resume and he definitely doesn't look good on resume on a resume. But when you talk to him in person, he's fantastic. Like he, he can really express himself. So that's what, that's what I advise is, you know, check out LinkedIn. I would not check out any other social media. That is not my advice at all. Um, but my advice would be, you know, check out LinkedIn and, and try to go above and beyond the resume. Perfect. We're, we're kind of over our time, but is there any last thing, Phil, you want to, you want to touch base or Nicole, you want to touch base on? I don't think so. Man, this was a phenomenal webinar. You know, I always love it when there's different uh, opposing views on certain aspects. Uh, Technology is here to stay. Embrace it. Embrace what's out there. Look for what can help you, not to make your job easy, or, but how it can make you more educated to make better decisions that are out there. Thank you, everybody, for attending the uh, HR Trends webinar. We'll see you on the next one.